a lack of water and extreme heat is holding the western United States hostage. Wildfires started early this season. Here in Oregon, the so-called bootleg fire has already destroyed an area bigger than Los Angeles. The mega fire is burning so hot and generating so much energy that it is essentially creating its own weather, spreading smoke as far as New York City. The fire is moving so fast that many ranchers weren't able to rescue their cattle. More than a hundred families have already lost their homes to the flames, while thousands were evacuated. It's totally unclear how long it'll take firefighters to get the flames under control. Many roads are still closed. The National Guard has been deployed to control traffic, with only ranchers allowed in to check on their cattle in many areas. The little community of Sprague River is only miles away from the edge of the fire. Summer has been living here for more than 20 years. I know that there were, there's probably uh, hundreds of cattle that have been lost and there's probably hundreds of cattle that are still out there. The Janes lost a bunch, the Yamsey Ranch up Joe Jane, they lost some. The Gallagher's out here at Whiskey Creek Ranch, which are like my family. The fire department put out information signs in the whole area to keep people updated. Brent and his wife just moved here to start a life as farmers. This fire has been much bigger and seeing the clouds from it and just seeing the containment line only be about this big right here for days and days and days, it's, it's been a big one. But when the wind blows that hard and the fire's that big, it's kind of hard to stop, especially with the, this dry. But I know that they're rationing groundwater all around here too. Farmers that uh, are newer to farming, it's on a first come, first serve as far as how long you've had your well and how long you've been using it. Year to year, it is becoming clearer. Access to water is defining who will be able to survive in this area and who won't make it. And it is already a reality that there is not enough water to meet the demands. Scott Soyce is a father of three and a third generation farmer within the Klamath Basin, a huge man-made irrigation system. We don't want to see bloom in the alfalfa like this. This is a crop that's under stress. And, and it's under stress because we can't get enough water to it. We're trying to take a very limited groundwater resource. Um, and we're trying to spread it over a lot of acres to try to keep our perennial crops alive. Scott's 400 acre farm is at an elevation of 4,000 feet. Besides alfalfa, he's growing onions, peppermint, garlic, and horseradish. I'm not willing to stand aside and, and roll over for this. I'm willing to fight for it because it's disrespectful to my dad and it's disrespectful to my grandfather. And it's, it's honestly not right for me not to give my children the opportunity to, to, to raise their family here and to have their kids have the opportunity to farm. That's my responsibility and that's why I don't walk away from it. Ben Duval has a much smaller farm but shares the same problems. Looking at something like climate change, it's very concerning because what does that mean for the sustainability of what we're doing here into the future? And at the same time, I think that irrigated ag is a great way for us to be able to be insulated somewhat from climate change because we're not dependent on, on rainfall in a particular month. You know, we can average that out at least over a year or maybe over several years if you have enough storage capacity in reservoirs and it gives us an opportunity to be able to produce crops even uh, when we are seeing more extremes in climate. Ben wants his daughters to continue the family tradition. He lost a leg in a car accident, but that hasn't stopped him from fighting for his family's right to farm.
The fight for water has already mobilized some farmers who set up a full-time protest next to the channels that regulate how much water they are allowed to access. We're just here trying to educate people, trying to get them to stand up and take their water. I mean, it's our water. I mean, we either got to take it and stand up and get it or we're going to lose it. We're going to have to forcefully take it. I mean, we're going to have to get the sheriff or somebody's going to have to come help us and we're going to have to take it and get it flowing or we're not going to have water here. This is the very place where officials decide how to divide the water. Do they divert it to farmers for their crops or do they keep it in the lakes and rivers on native lands? With too little water and the extreme heat, fish species, which are central to the diet and culture of local native tribes, are endangered. All this biomass that we see here, and by the fall all this will uh, have decomposed and resulted in the death of all the young of the year fish. Alex Gonya is a biologist who is monitoring the quality of the water and the status of the fish population for the Klamath tribes. In the short term, there's not much we can do about climate change. However, we can alter the water quality in a positive way. That means fencing cattle off of streams, not adding any additional phosphorus to the system, and allowing the aquatic ecosystem to heal itself, begin healing itself. Nature is amazing at doing that, but first we need to remove the human pressure from the system. The things that the Native American tribe, the Klamath tribes here value, have been largely completely disregarded during the, the settlement process. And it continues to be almost completely disregarded in terms of striking a balance between the ecosystem, the values of the tribes, agriculture, and the treatment of the landscape in general. It's been extremely one-sided. Don Gentry is the chairman of the Klamath tribes. They have been living in this area for thousands of years. And when you look out in the distance and you see the cascades and the, how beautiful it looks, and then you look into the green water that looks like pea soup this time of year, knowing that that creates conditions that are lethal to our fish, it's, it's heartbreaking. We're people of the lakes, marshes and streams, everything that the Creator placed here uh, uh, in the rivers and in the marshes and the lakes and on the landscape uh, was here and provided subsistence for us. All those resources, uh, uh, even in our legends and stories, and remind us of uh, how we're to be and what we're not to do, how we're to live, you know, remind us that Creator placed these things here for us for our subsistence, but to never abuse that. You know, we take only what we need and use everything that we take. We're uh, stewards. You know, and we're a part of things. Definitely concerned about uh, violence and, and uh, you know, just a continued uh, racist-based uh, marginalization of who we are and, uh, you know, what those fish mean to us. We're uh, portrayed as not being as important as other folks that generate a lot of money through agriculture. There hardly seem to be any possible winners in this war over water. But there will be many losers if the climate crisis isn't stopped. Charlotte Seuss, whose father could swim in this lake, might be one of them.